I guess. Hello, everyone. Maybe you can get started. My name is Daniel Almeida. I work for Calabra. I'm Brazilian. Uh, I'll be presenting about um, giving Rust a chance for in kernel codecs. I'll be speaking a little bit more about what in kernel codecs are, uh, what it, what I mean, and why we need Rust for this. I I, I also presented uh, a little bit about this at Linux Plumbers, which was awesome because now I have some feedback that I have uh, that I have uh, included in the talk. Um, so yes, I, I want to be clear to you all about one thing. This talk is about hardware accelerators uh, for codecs and about their safety issues and basically how we can um, attempt to solve this problem using Rust in the in the Visual Linux um, subsystem. And I want to begin by um, telling you guys what uh, uh, a codec accelerator is. It's a specialized hardware unit that we use in order to uh, basically, well, accelerate, I'm sorry, the uh, how fast you can basically do video encoding and decoding. Um, they're good because they keep your machine cool. I don't know about you guys, but like every time I have my laptop and it's hot, that's usually a cue for me to get my laptop off of my lap and maybe jump to the to the desktop. They're usually faster. Um, when when you're using a hardware accelerator for, for, for a codec, that will free up the main CPU from doing all the decoding or encoding work, but they come with a pretty major drawback. And the drawback for that is, well, now it needs this thing, right? And whereas beforehand you you would have everything implemented in a in, by like how could I say this in a user space process? Let's put it this way, or whereby where wherein you could have something running on the CPU. Let's I think that's a better way to put it. Now you have some hardware, so now you have hardware to drive, therefore you need a driver and you need an API to talk to this device and blah, 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 and blah, blah, blah. So whereas previously you only had a user space component, now you have both a user space component and a kernel component, which is obviously running with um, uh, privileges. I, I, I want to, in order to highlight the problem, because first I'm going to highlight the problem and then we're going to talk about how Rust can attempt to solve this, Let's look inside of what is within a video bitstream or a video file once you download that from the internet where you're watching YouTube or something along these lines. That's basically, that's basically what you have. Um, I didn't uh, depict here something called a container. So usually when you download a video file, you get a container like Machowska or NP4 or whatever. I didn't really picture this thing here, only the actual um, thing that's contained within the container, and obviously the majority of the data will be the um, actual um, compressed data that you want to hopefully decompress, so ac the actual video data, right? I think that's clear for everybody. But this guy over here also exists, and it's a problem. This metadata thing that is precisely why we should maybe use Rust in order to make these hardware accelerators work uh, main video for Linux. So this metadata thing, it's metadata, I, I don't know a better way to put this. It's data that will actually control the decoding process. So the hardware unit will be actually using this metadata to know how to interpret the data it's actually decoding. Does that make sense? So user space will, whenever, let's say you're, you open something um, on VLC, and then VLC will start parsing that and extracting the, both the metadata and the compressed data. And if VLC is using um, um, video for Linux as a decoder backend, it will send all of that to the kernel. And the kernel will have to use this metadata to program the device. And the key thing here I want to highlight is that a change in one parameter changes how the hardware interprets the rest of the bitstream. And this is totally from untrusted input. This is totally provided by user space. And it's a whole lot of metadata. If you guys have ever come across the AV1 specification or the HEVC specification or the H264 specification, it's a whole lot of data. They're basically parsing and sending to the kernel as is, and then the kernel will hopefully sift through everything and use that to program the device. Now, um, some user space programs, they might introduce their own checks. Like Chromium has a bunch of checks. Um, but, okay, that's user space, right? We basically cannot trust that um, from, a, from a kernel perspective. 
And in the kernel, we basically have a very ad hoc um, validation strategy, which means somebody sat down with a PDF of the specification and read a, a few things here and there and tried to manually have a bunch of if statements to check whether these, the, the metadata, whether the data within the metadata is actually within some bounds by basically reading the PDF and that's obviously not good, right? This is obviously very prone to errors. And then if something breaks, well, two things happen. The first thing is we hope that whatever broke is, is in user space, right? Because if user space crashed, well, that sucks and, you know, you have to maybe open up your browser again or open up VLC again or whatever and you shouldn't really be doing that because you, you may have lost some context for the user and blah, 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 but yeah. Or if that makes it all the way to the kernel, then we hope that this happens. That's the best case scenario, like your hardware unit hangs. And uh, I want to highlight this as well. I mean, I totally didn't know Greg was going to tell and say anything about reboots, but like if the hardware, if the decoder unit actually crashes, you have to reboot the machine, basically. Um, I know uh, we, we have one person here in the audience, Tony, he's been working on um, doing GPU resets when the GPU hangs or something along these lines. But I'm not really sure whether you can do the same for, for codec accelerators. I, I don't think so. You have to basically reboot the, 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 the whole computer. And I, I know it's not really good to have a bunch of text in slides, but really, I, I really wanted to have this thing here. So apparently I'm not the only guy who thinks this is a problem. There's this guy here, Willie, whose entire PhD has been about, hey, there's a problem here. And the whole idea, and I'll, I'll read just a little bit of the um, abstract. Um, it says that decoding video in practice means interacting with dedicated hardware accelerators and proprietary privileged hardware components used to drive them, blah, blah, blah. The video decoder ecosystem is obscure, opaque, diverse, highly privileged, largely untested, and highly exposed, which is a dangerous combination. So they introduced this program that they call H264, which they say it's a domain-specific infrastructure for analyzing, generating, and manipulating syntactically correct, but semantically spec non-compliant video file. What does this mean? Basically, this guy PhD thesis is about a program that can create a video file that can crash your computer. It can reliably create a video stream that once you put that thing through Chromium or you use any program, any user space program to actually do video decoding and you read that file, you're eventually going to have a crash somewhere. And they go further, they say, in a second case study, we played a whole lot of videos from uh, H264 and a variety of Windows software and Android systems from any dated but still relevant vendors. And all we identified a memory corruption vulnerability in Firefox. I use after free and hardware accelerated VLC video playback in security in depth across the hardware decoder ecosystem, including disclosure of initialized memory and of prior decoding state accelerator, memory corruption, and kernel driver memory corruption and crashes. So yes, yeah, so I'm not the only guy that realizes that there's a problem. So last year, um, I was at Plumbers last year and talking to Mauro Carvalho and other people from the media subsystem. And back then my idea was, okay, I see that Rust is picking up steam in the kernel. Why don't we try and write a codec driver entirely in Rust, right? Great, right? I mean, not so great because, yeah, reasons. Um, and why should Rust uh, help to fix this problem? For a whole lot of issues, I maybe highlighted a few of them. Um, mainly the things about, the, the, about Rust that I care is, to, to summarize everything that I've written down here is that, so long as you constrain yourself to safe Rust, you know that you're not going to be shooting yourself in the foot, right? So Rust will give you sized arrays, which um, you can check, you can do runtime bound checks using get, you can use iterators instead of for loops with a variable that you're going to be using to index, which you can probably use this index variable to index past the end of an array, it happens all the time in C, if you're not careful, so in Rust we have iterators, you can have references instead of pointers, and Rust has a lo whole lot of guarantees about references, mainly that references are always valid. 
it has guarantees about aliasing. You know, if you have a, a mutable reference, you know that you're the only person that has access to that particular piece of memory. And it also provides, you know, ownership, um, lifetimes, destructors, and, you know, that, this is why I, I think that Rust can really help solve this problem because it's more modern. And so, again, so long as you keep yourself within safe Rust, you're probably not, not going to get yourself um, shot in the foot. So um, just a brief recap. Last year I wanted to do a driver, but that idea didn't really flow that well. And the reason why was, well, if you want to have a, if you want to have a driver, as um, Andreas um, explained about a few t uh, a, a few hours ago this morning, you need to have a bunch of abstractions, right? We had a talk here just about abstractions, and guess what? Uh, abstractions didn't really fly well with a whole lot of kernel maintainers, including the media people. In fact, if you remember from um, well, the argument between um, Wetson and Theodore, one of the things that they were arguing about was precisely this abstraction stuff. Who is going to maintain this? You know, that's things um, that I also heard from, from the media people, um, that Wetson uh, heard from the file system people. This this. This is uh, something that we've been hearing a lot as uh, Rust developers. Who's going to maintain this layer of abstractions? Will these abstractions slow down development in C? If I, if I have a bunch of abstractions and I don't know any Rust and I'm a kernel maintainer and I'm writing C code, will I get bogged down because of your abstractions in Rust you just wrote? Will this break my code? And also, in particular, for the video for Linux community, they said, hey, we're also pretty much overwhelmed as we are, and you want to merge this new language, this support for this new language, and blah, blah, blah. So this idea with um, the, the whole driver thing didn't really work that well. So I thought to myself, OK, so what if we could sidestep the entire problem? And that's why I'm here today. It's, uh, it's a strategy to make sure that we do not have to use any bindings. Therefore, hopefully nobody has anything to complain. In fact, when I'm done here, one of the things I'm going to ask you guys is whether anybody hates this, because I may have overlooked something. But so far, I think I have solved most of the complaints, hopefully. So what if we could write Rust code without bindings? And turns out that it's possible, so long as you give up on the idea of having an entire driver in Rust. And you, instead of having an entire driver in Rust, you try to convert only a few functions or a few components um, of the kernel to Rust at a time. And I'm going I'm, I'm to be saying a, a few things more about what uh, these components ideally should be. And ideally, they should be self-contained. If you choose something that doesn't talk too much to the rest of the kernel, that's a good candidate for this particular strategy. If it's only something that's taking data in, doing some processing, and then speeding data back out without touching a bunch of other stuff in the kernel, that's good. You're going to have a very good chance of applying the strategy I'll be describing here. So this is what sidestep most of the issues uh, that were raised basically last year. I'm going to go a little bit more on the implementation of this thing. Um, so it's not really too complicated. This is very well known for most Rust developers over here. You guys can see, um, I keep pointing at the monitor with the, uh, with the thingy. Over here, you guys can see just a regular Rust function, which I have aptly named named call me from C. It's a Rust function. Like most other Rust functions, it has a, a FN function token, which just means I'm a function. It has a pub, which means it's a public function, function which is a concept in Rust. That's all completely trivial. But the real interesting thing here is there's no mingle attribute on top and this extern C thing here. Basically, when the Rust compiler sees this, what it's going to do is it's going to generate machine code as usual, but machine code that can be called upon from C because it's using the C calling convention. Turns out that if the compiler emits the uh, machine code that can be call, called from C and you include this machine code somewhere in some object file the, and, and you tell the linker how to find it, the linker will link against your function. And if you call that function from your C code in, in other parts of the kernel, that would just work you will get a, um, how should I put this, a transparent um, switch 
from Rust, I'm sorry, from C into Rust. Is this clear to anybody, to everybody, I'm sorry? It's just once, let me just uh, point one thing out for you guys. Once you have machine code, there's no telling who generated it. You cannot really say whether it was a C compiler or a Rust compiler. It's just code, and that's what underpins most of the strategy. You push this code there, you, 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 you um, basically will have the linker link against this code, and bam, you've got a transition at runtime. But <clears throat> as, as I said, we have this uh, no mingle thing and this extra C thing on top, which I should explain a little bit more. There's no mingle attribute. Basically, the people laughed when I said that at the, at the media summit. It disables mingling, which doesn't really explain much, but mingling is a implementation detail that's used both by C++ and Rust and maybe other languages to encode a few fe features. So it is through mingling that we can have namespaces. It is through mingling that we can have generic parameters. It is through mingling that we can have closures. Um, it is through mingling that we can have the, the method syntax. But we definitely don't want to have mingling in this particular case because how are you going to call this function from C, right? This is completely not workable. So you basically want to have the same name this is the same name that you have named your function to be the name that appears here and not this bunch of other stuff. So I have to disable mingling for that. And once you disable mingling, you lose a whole bunch of stuff, right? The genetic exposure is namespacing your methods, which is fine because for the functions that we're going to use to interface with the C code, well, C doesn't really know about any of these things, right? C has no concepts of generics, of closures, and namespacing, and any of that. So we're not losing anything, so that's not a problem. And the extern C, as I, as I told you guys, is just to make sure that C can call this function. And as I said, the linker will comply, and you will be, you will be able to call this from, from, from C. And the whole idea, as I said, is that you identify a public, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, a small self-contained component, hopefully one with a small public API, something that doesn't show up everywhere with the large API, because otherwise you would have trouble, you know, converting everything, something that's small. And then you rewrite, you, you, you rewrite the, the code in Rust, and you rewrite the public API with this, these signatures, with the nomingle and no mingling and externcy, as we talked about. And that's most of the work, really. But there's one thing missing. You need to somehow have a function prototype, right? Even for C code, if you're calling a function that you have defined in another translation unit, let's put it this way, um, well, then you need a prototype for that. Or if it's in the same translation unit, the function has to, to, to have either a prototype or be defined above the function that um, it's, it's, you're using to call um, uh, to call it. So we need a way to have a header file with some nice C prototypes, right? And the first thing you can do is you can handwrite it. This works. If you just handwrite this thing, so previously, again, we had this extern C uh, function coming from C that takes no arguments. Here we have, uh, and doesn't return anything, by the way. And here we have void call me from C that doesn't take any arguments. So it's equivalent, and it works. This works, this is not good, because as soon as you do anything that's not non-trivial, you're basically going to have, you know, all sorts of nasty bugs, because you can mess with the type layouts, um, and, and things can, can get out of sync, and this would be really hard to debug. Believe me, I've tried, and it took me forever just to identify, oh, I have an argument, I added a new field, and now it, it doesn't match between Rust and C, and blah, 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 so this is why it's not working, basically. And the good thing is there's a tool. And the tool is actually maintained by Mozilla, which is, in my opinion, good because it's a major player in the um, software industry. And the name of the tool is CBindgen. So CBindgen is a tool that will take your Rust code and notice anywhere in your Rust code where you have this type of function, this type of signature, and it will emit a header file with this, with a C equivalent declaration. And the good thing about Symbygen is, if it finds that you're using an argument, let's say you take a pointer to struct foo, well, then it's going to go in your Rust code and see, well, 
what's a struct foo? I, sh I should generate a definition for this. So not only it will convert, it works recursively. First, we'll identify all functions with the, the signature, then all the parameters that it uses and blah, 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 and just output that into a, um, a header file automatically. And some of you may be puzzled on um, how does this work, right? How can you convert a Rust data type into Rust? And this is the magic, right? This rep C annotation that you have on top. So for the type layout in Rust, the default is the Rust layout, which is unstable. But turns out that you can change that using this annotation. This annotation just tells the Rust compiler, hey, Rust compiler, please lay out this type exactly as a C compiler would. If the Rust compiler lays out the type exactly as a C compiler would, you can interop between Rust and C transparently. You can interop your data, your structs, your enums between Rust and C uh, transparently. Does that make sense? Does anybody have uh, questions about this? All right. So a summary of what we've talked about so far. You select a hopefully self-contained uh, component with a small public API. You compile that using Rust-C, like you rewrite the code in Rust and you compile that using Rust-C. Um, the public API, you will have to have that um, signature we talked about with the domain cleaning stuff and extern C. We use the C bindgen tool to automatically generate a header file. We include this header file in the part of the kernel that we care about, that we want to call these functions from. And that's it. Problem solved. No bindings using Rust. Transparent transparent um, switch between languages. Nothing to maintain. It's a much less ambitious take, but for me, it works. So I, I did a proof of concept. Um, I in, in Rust for Linux, we have some, again, small self-contained components, and that means for me mostly this, a codec library. Uh, for those of you who do not know what a codec library is, uh, again, we're talking about hardware accelerators, right? Hardware units that can do video decoding and encoding faster. And these hardware accelerators, they do most of the work, but they don't do all of the work. Some of it has to be done by the CPU for various reasons. And usually you have to take the algorithm from the specification, write a C version from, from the pseudocode in, in the specification, and then have your driver call that, basically, at points that the, the specification mandate you to, to do so, tell you to, to call these functions. And as soon as a second driver came along and introduced the same function, again, because these algorithms are part of the codec specification, somebody said, well, let's extract that into a, into a, into a module. That's basically what these um, codec libraries are, a bunch of codec algorithms that somebody pulled out from drivers and made them into their own module. Um, so, again, okay, I've already said about um, all these things. It's um, codec algorithms that run on the CPU. Um, they do some processing on, on data, and they feed this data back to the hardware, um, and they're self-contained. And I took one of those, and I rewrote it in Rust. And there's a tool. This is a good thing. There's a tool. There's a testing tool. And the way that this testing tool works is it will run the CPU implementation, for VP9, that's libvpx. I don't know how many of you have ever used libvpx before. So it'll run libvpx and ask, hey, libvpx, can you decode this file? It will take this file. It will ask your um, hardware unit, hey, can you decode this file? And it will compare the two, the two. And if you have a match, that's a success. And that's how we get a number on how performant, or I shouldn't say performant, but on how compliant and correct um, or hardware implementation is. Of course, the CPU implementation will get 100%, right? At least the um, the canonical implementation, like libvpx will, of course, have 100%, and your hardware will have less for, ver for various reasons. And when I rewrote this in Rust, I got the exact same score. Zero regressions. Works just the same. So I came back this year with, uh, to, the, to the Linux media people with new proposals. So I told them, hey, I want to merge this code and get this behind a kconfig. And hopefully we users will get this implementation by default because we don't want to disturb anybody. 
And we can maybe try and run the Rust version on a CI. And we'll see whether there are any regressions. If there's no regressions, then hopefully we can merge this and deprecate this implementation. Um, so compared to last year, this is a overall much less a, a much less ambitious approach, which for me is fine, because what this means is it will inconvenience maintainers much less. Therefore, they they may be more accepting of merging this. And the good thing here is I've highlighted this in bold. If at any time in the future somebody decides to have Rust drivers for Codex, we can use the Rust versions of the libraries from the Rust drivers just the same. We just don't need the external C, you know, mangle stuff. We can call the functions directly if you want from Rust code. So both Rust drivers and C drivers um, can use the, the C code this way, thereby giving us a viable path to the future if we decide to have Rust drivers in the future. And so the thing about having a driver versus um, having, you know, this is a strategy where you, you convert some components is, I don't care. I just want to fix this. I want to fix, as I told you guys, the handling of metadata. So long as we can take all this metadata, this untrusted metadata from user space, and we can handle this in Rust, I don't care whether we have a full driver, whether we have components or anything. I just want to be able to tackle this data using a safe language. Um, so that, I, I told you guys what I asked from, you know, the media people. And what I got was, you know, this list, like this uh, list of feedback. So the first thing I was asked was to please provide examples of actual crashes that are generated by some file that crashes the, the system with the C code and that your Rust code hopefully fix. Measure any performance impacts. Does this hurt performance in any way? Also, please help us enable the Rust support in Media CI and use Media CI to test this thing. And if you do all of these things, they told me, eventually we're going to let you merge the code into set slash staging slash media. So this is much more progress, right? I was expecting a flat out no. And instead I got a maybe and, and it just looks kind of workable. From I also presented this at the Rust for Linux um, conference this year. And people say, well, for this particular approach that you're trying to apply this to, which is components that take in data that do not interface much with the rest of the kernel and just spit data back out, this is actually a good thing. This is actually a very good approach to deal with this problem. In terms of performance, there should be absolutely no overhead. And what I mean by absolute no overhead is there should be obviously no overhead to the no mingling external C stuff. The checks obviously cost something, right? Because we'll have more instructions. Again, I don't care. And the reason I don't care is because by far, by far, programming the hardware with the metadata is not what it, it's not a bottleneck. The bottleneck for a hardware decoder is when you, you tell the hardware unit, okay, you have all the metadata to do the decoding, now please go and apply this to a 4K video. Dealing with the 4K stream is actually the hard part, not programming the device. So I don't care if this is a little bit slower. Um, it shouldn't really affect um, real use cases by any means whatsoever. Although I don't believe it will be much slower at all. And uh, it's, I, I don't think Paul Kochakovsky is here because he's the guy working on stateless encoders, the support for stateless encoders in beautiful Linux. Hopefully we can use this uh, when stateless encoders come about, which should be in like one or two years. When, because for, for encoders, we'll have the reverse problem. If for decoders, the problem is uh, ingesting this bunch of metadata that's untrusted and parts from user space, for encoders, it's the reverse. It's actually generating this metadata in a safe way. And I also want to use Rust for that. But this is like one or two years from now, or maybe more. As I told you guys, who hates this? Raise your hands, anybody who dislikes this? Questions? Hello, All right. How much, so 
we had a little explanation of the abstractions before. Now you have these um, Rust functions that are exposed as uh, C symbols, and you can call them from C. Probably you're going to pass some pointers to your data in there, and then you're going to do some checking of the pointers and like whatever, right? It has the metadata. So there's like, there must be some um, unpacking of the C types and putting into Rust references, right? Yeah. So that, um, when you implement the next codec library, I don't know VP, what is VP10, maybe? I don't know how that works. <laughs> yeah. You're going to have some uh, duplicated code. And you're probably, I would guess, right? And uh, because you, you are, you're taking, you're implementing an interface that's callable from C. Sure. Right? And you are going to do some of the same operations on this data. Uh, no, I don't, no, I don't think so. Because, it, well, you have to know a little bit about Vita for Linux to, to actually know why this is not the yeah, I have no idea, so I'm just guessing. No, they're completely separate. So, Each codec has its own thing. So the, the interface you're implementing uh, that's called by the kernel, is that's like, there's no overlap between no. two different codecs. No, no overlap. Okay, my, my next follow-up was going to be, you're probably going to want to extract that into like something shared, and there's your abstractions. But if it's not, that's not the way it is, then no, no, it, cool. There's no overlap, yeah. Okay. Questions? Um, so you said that um, you cannot use uh, destructors, uh, interface types because of this uh, external C. But inside this function, can you use all of us, like destructors, interfaces, uh, um, generics, uh, as long as you export the C symbol, I guess you can do use full Rust inside of your C function. Yes, that's just for the interface, just for the, the public func functions. So from there on, you can use all of Rust, templates, I'm sorry, generics and everything. And even use like structs that don't uh, comply to any C ABI or something. You, you can have structs that are not, um, um, because when you have rep C, it, you cannot have any struct annotated with RepC. It will place restrictions on your type. Um, because like, it has to be something that C understands, right? And eventually, that will mean that you cannot use some Rust features if you want to have your type be representable in C. Yeah, but I mean, in your internal code, you can do whatever uh, without being compatible with C. Yes, and also there is more. You can also um, pass pointers to structs that are not RepC to see, but so long as they're opaque pointers and you don't touch them anywhere. Okay. Yeah. So to, <clears throat> to my understanding, every codec has its own metadata, is that right? Yes. So <clears throat> who, I wonder who's going to maintain this metadata parsing code when it's like, I mean, each codec, I guess, has its own maintainer. And is that person going to maintain the Rust code, or is there going to be some kind of generic maintainer for the Rust part? Um, yeah, we didn't discuss this, but this person is probably going to be me, because probably the other people are a little bit overwhelmed with their current tasks as is. So the responsibility for basically maintaining the Rust stuff would probably fall to me. So, like, how does often does the metadata change? Maybe never. Is that right? Or? The actual metadata change on a frame per frame basis, but you mean the 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 the, the, the design the, of the metadata? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So never. Never. never? Yeah. Okay. Or so, almost never. I so should say never. <laughs> okay. So, in principle, once you've made the code, it should stay as it is forever, and no one should have to yes. worry much about it. Yes. Hopefully. I mean, we have, uh, we have quite a few of these, and I don't think nobody has ever touched anything. Okay, thank you. I, I also had somebody ask me, hey, you're trying to change something that works for something that works. And I'm like, yeah, but how can you be sure that the original thing actually works, right? Because if you had a bug here in the C code, you would have fixed it, right? That's the nature of bugs. If you knew there was a bug, you would have fixed it. So. Who's to say that the, the Rust code, the C code, is bug-free? Does that make sense to you guys? 
Uh, okay, so my question will kind of relate to the first one, which was asked in the audience. Uh, but you mentioned that in your case, uh, your metadata types are self-contained, the, so there is no overlap between NSC types and your RAS types you have inside. But I'm wondering, I mean, it's not true for all the subsystems. And for example, for block device drivers or for network drivers, you need to use the C types. And uh, I'm wondering, I mean, does it disqualify the approach, um, your, your approach of having um, just function, uh, just functions for those subsystems or is it completely impossible and uh, yeah, the other subsystems will have to carry on with the abstractions. I'll tell you two things. Um, the first thing is I don't necessarily promise that this works outside of media because I don't have the experience to make this claim. Um, the second thing is um, I, the meta, the, the like the Rust version I wrote is identical, uh, the, the, the data structures that is, is identical to the C version. So I don't see why you wouldn't be able to uh, make this make this conversion in other subsystems. But for DRAM, which is completely different from what I'm working on, um, we're trying to um, rewrite a, a driver for R, Mali, GPUs, and Rust. And this approach didn't actually work very well there. Because for reasons of how the uh, abstractions uh, for, for DRAM and Rust are actually shaping up, it, this approach didn't really fit with the overall strategy. So maybe, for, for, for some subsystems, this may not work. All right, thank you. So um, for modules, we, we have a patch series for module parameters uh, going, going in. And uh, we had a similar situation. The maintainer was completely over overwhelmed. And he said, like, Louis said, I'm not, there's no way I'm taking this. Look at my backlog. Uh, we, we need more people. And so what came out of that was actually, so he, he didn't just want people for maintaining the Rust stuff. He needed more people and that could maintain all of the stuff, right? And so he put out a call, like, if we're going to get this in, like, get me some more maintainers and we got uh, one person like from the rust you know camp to sign up but actually also two other people see people signed up and was like okay we'll we'll help out we'll uh, help maintain modules uh, to unblock this and so that's also an op like now uh, i don't know how it works in video but uh, they could ask for help right get more, if they are blocked and bandwidth in maintaining, maybe put out a call for help. Collabor is already helping actually. So as Collabor is, is pushing pretty strongly for current CI and etc., one of the things that they did with this initiative was to train a person just to take up this role of helping the media people, which is my colleague Sebastian Fricke, has been, has been shaping up to, to be this person in the near future, I believe. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Which is unrelated with the Rust stuff, but it helps, as, as you said. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so, le if we, let's say we re-implement a bunch of codecs in Rust and we deprecate the C counterpart, is it going to affect uh, the pool of architectures that the codec will support? Uh, how is the status of Rust for? I've been to three conferences speaking about this, and in the three conferences, including this one, I've been asked this question. So short story. <laughs> I had to ask also this one. Short story is I care about ARM64. Why? Because these drivers only make sense for ARM64. The devices, you know, they, they're like, it, it, it doesn't really make sense to talk about any other ar architecture here. So I, I don't think it's going to be a problem. What would be a problem is if you were replacing the, um, if you were replacing like, Compo the major components of the video for Linux framework, then yes. So if you're trying to replace video buff 2 or M2M or that sort of stuff, then yes. Yeah, but as long as you support uh, the x86 and ARM64, uh, I guess. Yeah. You cover everything. I can add a little bit of context to that. We have um, currently Rust C is the uh, LLVM based Rust compiler that we use. But there are works on a different backend for Rust C that emits um, GCC 
I believe it's called Gimbal GCC IR. And then you can use the GCC backend to lower that IR to all of the targets that GCC supports. This, uh, with this approach, you can actually build the vanilla kernel without patches and boot it, uh, but it's still in the experimental state. But I would, uh, again, you should never make promises about how long stuff takes, right? But I would say like a few years and then uh, this uh, approach becomes, uh, probably becomes viable. And then we can, um, I mean, then that is not an issue anymore, the targets we support. We have um, another uh, compiler in the works that is a complete re-implementation of the Rust C frontend inside GCC, so full GCC project. And um, that one is like ha has further to go yet, but uh, I mean, it, it's coming. Yeah, sure. Any takers, more questions? <clears throat> Hey, um, just some thoughts and a huge thank you because I think not only does that fix a bunch of maybe potential, but obviously existing issues according to the paper you cited. Um, and it also enables a bunch of people who are just, you know, learning to program nowadays. And uh, I've seen lots of people who are just looking at Rust and not even at C. So, yeah, somebody asking for maintainers here. I think that also enables future maintenance, actually. So thank you. Nice. Thank you. Questions? Um, do you know if C by Gen works well when linking objects uh, built by GCC uh, and uh, Rust C? Because I think Mozilla builds with the uh, Clang, I think. So I'm wondering if the C ABI is the same between the two compilers. Mm. I should say that from the top of my mind, I don't think there should be issues. Thanks. Okay, if uh, no more questions, thank you for having me here. This is my first time. <laughs> <laughs>